From the mid-1950s to the early 70s, one film company dominated the marketplace in terms of horror films. That company was Hammer. Unlike the classical universal monster films of the 1930s and 40s, Hammer had three things. They were filmed in color, had blood, and nudity. Things you wouldn't dare see in Hollywood at the time. Hammer was the company that introduced us to such great talent from people like Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and Michael Goff. The latter two would become frequent collaborators of Tim Burton, who paid tribute to Hammer with his 1999 horror film, Sleepy Hollow. Today I'm going to reveal to you 12 of my favorite films made by this company. This is my top 12 favorite Hammer Films. Number 12, The Devil Rides Out, a.k.a. The Devil's Bride. Based on the book by Dennis Wheatley and written for the screen by Richard Matheson, The Devil Rides Out involves Christopher Lee as the Duke de Richelieu, out to rescue two potential converts from fully committing to a satanic cult led by Charles Gray. Do you believe in evil? As an idea. Do you believe in the power of darkness? As a superstition. Now there you were wrong. Christopher Lee insisted that Hammer try its hands on adapting Dennis Wheatley's book. The result was what Christopher Lee would describe as his favorite of the many films he's made for Hammer. So much so, he even went so far as to say that he would love to see a remake with modern special effects. The author, Dennis Wheatley, was so pleased with the film, he gave Christopher Lee a first edition of his novel. I find it kind of fascinating that two Bond villains go head-to-head, -head, since Christopher Lee played Scaramanga in Man with the Golden Gun, and Charles Gray played Blofeld in Diamonds Are Forever. In the name of God, you dare not! Scarcely in the name of God, Monsieur Le Duc. Also, Terence Fisher, the film's director, suffered an automobile accident and as a result had to be replaced when the film was in post-production. Still, critics have called it one of his best works of his career. Thank God. Yes, Simon. He is the one we must thank. Number 11, Taste the Blood of Dracula. The fifth entry of Hammer's Dracula series, Taste the Blood of Dracula, involves a group of men who don't know what to do with themselves. They soon meet up with a Satanist, played by Ralph Bates, who allows them to bear witness to a resurrection of Dracula, played once again by Christopher Lee. They have destroyed my servant. They will be destroyed. Originally, Dracula wasn't going to appear in this film at all. Christopher Lee reported to have hated doing the sequels because he felt that Hammer was writing the stories first and then inserting Dracula. The Ralph Bates character was originally going to be resurrected as a vampire after consuming Dracula's blood and kills the other three men one by one. But Warner Brothers, Hammer's American distributor at the time, refused to release the film unless Dracula makes an appearance in the film. So Hammer had to negotiate with Lee in order for him to appear in the film. This movie might be one of the weakest entries in the Dracula series, but what really saves the film is Christopher Lee as Dracula. Even though he doesn't say much, 
but just by looking at him, you're unsettled. Also, Ralph Bates is very interesting and delightfully diabolical, too. Drink, Jimmy Ali, drink! Don't insult the master! Drink, damn you! You drink, then! You drink it! You drink the filth! Not one of the best, but still enjoyable. I have no further use for you! Number 10. Dracula Has Risen from the Grave, the fourth entry of the Dracula series. The film opens with a Monsignor trying to exorcise Dracula's castle, but in doing so, he accidentally revives Dracula. He then follows the Monsignor back to his hometown, where he targets his beautiful niece and her atheist beau, played by Barry Andrews. Unlike a good majority of the Hammer films which were directed by Terence Fisher, this film is directed by Freddie Francis. Francis was already an Oscar-winning cinematographer for Sons and Lovers. Francis got the job after Terence Fisher suffered an automobile accident. Alongside cameraman Arthur Grant, Francis shoots the scenes involving Dracula with an interesting touch of color alongside of the frames. Francis used this technique of using color filters on the film The Innocent. Now my revenge is complete. Interestingly enough, the scenes of Dracula getting staked through the heart was shot on Christopher Lee's birthday, and oddly enough, the scene of Dracula's demise was shot on the day Hammer was given the Queen's Award to Industry. So this was shot in the presence of the Lord Lieutenant of Buckinghamshire, who presented the award on behalf of the Queen. Ain't that a pretty picture. Number 9. The Revenge of Frankenstein. The second installment of Hammer's Frankenstein series, the film picks up immediately after The Curse of Frankenstein, with Dr. Frankenstein, played again by Peter Cushing, awaiting execution by guillotine. But somehow he manages to escape, goes under the alias Dr. Stein, and he continues his horrific experiments. Unlike the Universal Frankenstein series, which focuses on the monster, Hammer's Frankenstein series focuses on the Doctor. Peter Cushing is in almost every one of the Frankenstein films he did for Hammer, with the exception of Horror of Frankenstein. And in each film, Cushing gives a performance that is always enjoyable to watch, no matter how ridiculous or cheesy the film becomes. Also, the monster he creates has a pretty impressive makeup job. Number 8. The Evil of Frankenstein. The third installment to Hammer's Frankenstein series, the film involves a destitute Victor Frankenstein and his assistant Hans going to a village in Yugoslavia to continue his experiments. There he discovers the creature trapped in ice. After the creature is revived, a hypnotist uses the monster to kill off his enemies. This is the first of eight films Freddie Francis directed that featured Peter Cushing. Also, for the first time, Hammer teamed up with Universal, and Universal financed the film. Now, before that, the look of the creature in the two previous films of the Hammer Frankenstein series stayed as far away from the iconic look of the monster from the Universal films to avoid any legal action. But this time, since Universal financed the film, they were given free reign to duplicate the makeup. But alas, it is no Jack Pierce job. The creature is played by New Zealand wrestler Kiwi Kingston. Of the Hammer Frankenstein films, this might be the closest thing you would expect from a generic Frankenstein film you would see in the 1940s, almost in the same vein as The Ghost of Frankenstein or The Son of Frankenstein. 
Not one of the best, but the visuals are amazing. Number 7. Dracula, Prince of Darkness. The third of Hammer's Dracula series, and the second to feature Christopher Lee as the Count, the story involves four unsuspecting travelers visiting the Carpathian Mountains. There they stay at Castle Dracula. Count Dracula. Count Dracula. One of the travelers is killed by Dracula's servant and uses his blood to resurrect the Count, who has been dead for ten years. Now, Dracula doesn't appear in the film for 45 minutes, also, Dracula doesn't say a single word in this film. Christopher Lee had said that he looked at the dialogue and thought his lines were stupid, so he refused to say them. However, the film's screenwriter, Jimmy Sangster, claimed that he didn't even write dialogue for Dracula. I don't know which is the true version, but that's the reason why Dracula doesn't utter a single word in this film. Also worth mentioning is that at the very end of the film, Dracula gets killed by falling into a frozen lake and drowning. It was this film that established that running water can also kill a vampire. Now, I can understand holy water killing a vampire because of it being corrosive, but running water? It should also be mentioned that Eddie Powell... Lee's stunt double nearly drowned while shooting this scene. Gotta take my hat off to the stunt team. Number 6. The Hound of the Baskervilles. Based on the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle book, the film involves the great detective of Baker Street, Sherlock Holmes, and his partner Professor Watson, investigating the mystery of the Hound from Hell taking revenge on the Baskervilles. There is more evil around us here than I have ever encountered before. Well, I still don't see... Now, this was the first cinematic adaptation of Conan Doyle's book to be filmed in color, and was hoped that would be the first of a series of films featuring the great detective Sherlock Holmes to be played by Peter Cushing. However, when audiences ignored this film due to the fact that no monsters were in the film, the idea was scrapped. I know a lot of Holmes fans are eager to mention Basil Rathbone as the definitive Sherlock Holmes, I mean, his version is iconic, but Peter Cushing manages to stay as close to the literary interpretation of Holmes more so than Rathbone does. In this film, we see him fix his correspondence with a jackknife, as Holmes would usually do in the Holmes stories. It was suggested by Cushing himself that he'd do that in the film. Still, the film received some good reviews. Time Out London even called it the best Sherlock Holmes film ever made, and one of Hammer's finest movies. It's incredible. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. Number 5. The Mummy. Released in 1959, The Mummy involves a group of British archaeologists finding the tomb of an Egyptian princess but they accidentally revive her high priest. The Mummy was a result of a 1958 deal between Hammer and Universal Pictures to remake some of their intellectual properties. The Mummy was the first of those films. The Phantom of the Opera in 1962, starring Herbert Lom, was the second. But when that film failed, a third film, The Invisible Man, was scrapped. Although the film's title is suggesting that this is a remake of the 1932 film starring Boris Karloff, the plot is more derived from the Mummy sequels of the 1940s, like The Mummy's Hand and The Mummy's Tomb. The ending of The Mummy's Ghost is also incorporated as well. The Mummy, unlike the Karloff film isn't talkative. They establish that 
his tongue was removed before being buried alive, a shot too extreme for British censors. Roy Ashton is the man responsible for this outstanding makeup job on Christopher Lee. Lee also suffered a great deal on this film as well. A grip accidentally bolted down a door Lee was supposed to crash through, and Lee dislocated his shoulder. Lee got burned by a squib, Lee threw his back out while carrying the girl, and Lee injured his knees and shins while doing the scenes in the studio tank to simulate a swamp. He was unable to see the pipes and fittings underneath the swampy waters. The things an actor has to go through. Number 4. The Brides of Dracula. The second of the Hammer Dracula films, the film involves a beautiful Parisian schoolteacher falling prey to a handsome Baron Meinster. Now it's up to Professor Van Helsing to find and destroy him. With the success of the first Dracula of the series, Hammer was eager to make a follow-up. Christopher Lee is not in the film as he was unavailable. So, at the beginning of the film, it is established that Dracula is dead to begin with, much like Jacob Marley in Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Count Dracula, monarch of all vampires, is dead, but his disciples live on. So the central performance to enjoy in this film is Peter Cushing returning as Van Helsing. David Peel as Baron Meinster is no Christopher Lee by any means, but still pulls off a reasonable performance. He manages to pull off the dichotomy of the handsome vampire being a charming gentleman one minute, the next being a blood-sucking demon from hell. Beautiful, isn't she? What a pity such beauty must fade. Unless we preserve it. She's going to join us, Doctor. And you are going to watch her initiation. If Emma Watson has the cutest British accent I've ever heard, then Yvonne Monlour had the cutest French accent I've ever heard. The whole night was like a bad dream. I can hardly believe it happened. Don't talk about it there. Baroness seemed so kind at first, but her son... Her son? But, but surely he's not still alive. It's such a long story. Also, Frida Jackson has a laugh that sounds like Cruella de Vil. <laughs> the Brides of Dracula is mostly ignored by Dracula fans because the fact that Christopher Lee wasn't in the film, which is a shame because it's actually a great film and worth viewing for Peter Cushing's performance. And also, it's marvelous cinematography by Jack Asher. Number 3. The Curse of the Werewolf. Released in 1961, The Curse of the Werewolf begins with a wandering beggar offending some uptight aristocrats and is condemned to be imprisoned in the dungeons. He makes friends with a mute daughter of a jailer Eventually, he rapes and impregnates her. Soon, she dies while giving birth to a son, Leon. Leon is then adopted by a generous noble. As he grows to be a man, it is soon discovered that Leon is a werewolf. This film is loosely based on the 1933 book The Werewolf of Paris by Guy Endori. The film, however, is set in Spain. The reason for this was because Hammer had this elaborate back lot set built for a film about the Spanish Inquisition, which was canned when the Catholic National Legion of Decency threatened to have the film banned. So they didn't want all that work to go to waste. Unlike many werewolf movies, in which a person who is bitten by a werewolf and lives becomes a werewolf himself, this film invokes the much older idea that a child born on Christmas Day will be the victim of the Lupin curse. In many European countries, it was believed that such a child was competing with the assumed birth of Jesus Christ, 
and that the curse was a punishment for blasphemy. This was Oliver Reed's first starring role. However, he doesn't appear in this film until halfway through the film, and his werewolf appears just an hour into the film, which runs about 93 minutes. Still, the look of the werewolf is really good. Number two, The Curse of Frankenstein. The film that jump-started a line of horror films for Hammer, The Curse of Frankenstein, is a retelling of Mary Shelley's novel of a mad scientist creating a monster out of human body parts. The film's screenwriter, Jimmy Sangster, didn't manage to watch any of the Universal Frankenstein films while writing the script. Instead, he adapted the Mary Shelley novel. Although the finished film includes moments not in the novel, such as the book ends of Victor Frankenstein sitting in a jail cell while awaiting the guillotine. But still, Hammer did its own thing without drawing from the same well as Universal. And that goes especially for the creature played by Christopher Lee. Lee was cast as the creature mainly because of his height being 6 feet 5 inches, the makeup artist Phil Leakey makes the monster look like something actually cobbled together out of human body parts, and Lee makes him move like a broken marionette. Peter Cushing makes Victor Frankenstein more of a monster than the creature he creates. Victor, where is this brain to come from? I'll get it. If you step back a little... You'll see, Beth. Look out, Beth! Look out! When this film opened, critics were appalled, calling it depressing and degrading for anyone who loves the cinema. But in later years, filmmakers like Martin Scorsese and Tim Burton would pay tribute to this film in some of their films. So I guess it's all a matter of taste. If I can't cure it by brain surgery, then I'll get another brain. And another. And another. And my number one favorite Hammer film is... Dracula. A.K.A. Horror of Dracula. Following the success of The Curse of Frankenstein, Hammer decided that the next film to tackle was Bram Stoker's Dracula. However, due to budgetary constraints, this film strays from the Stoker novel more so than the Universal film with Bela Lugosi. The movie starts out just like the book, with Jonathan Harker arriving at Castle Dracula. But instead of being a real estate agent come to sell Count Dracula a home, he has come to be Dracula's librarian. But we soon learn that he has come to slay Dracula. You see, Harker is in fact a vampire hunter in training by Professor Van Helsing. Also, Harker is engaged to wed Lucy when in the book he is engaged to Mina. Jimmy Sangster must really like to make things confusing, doesn't he? Christopher Lee manages to make the part of Count Dracula his own and copies nothing from Bela Lugosi. Count Dracula, I am Dracula and I welcome you to my house. It's always a difficult thing for an actor who plays Dracula to try and stay away from Bela Lugosi and make it your own. Unless you're doing a parody of the character, then that's okay. But here, Lee starts out being a gentleman one minute to a bloodthirsty animal. Peter Cushing as Professor Van Helsing is also regarded as the definitive Van Helsing. Please try and understand. This is not Lucy, the sister you loved. It's only a shell, possessed and corrupted by the evil of Dracula. Also included is Michael Goth. He's sort of the audience. He doesn't believe the existence of the supernatural until he slowly becomes convinced of it by the end. If there were such things, they could change themselves into bats or wolves. That's a common fallacy. One of the best moments of the film is the climax in which Van Helsing and Dracula go man to man in a fight to the death. Van Helsing even lets the, in the sunlight, causing him to disintegrate before our very eyes. The British censors hacked this moment, and it eventually was someone from Japan who found the missing shots and was properly restored and put on Blu-ray. 
Still, this is the movie I think of when I think of Hammer, and it rightfully deserves the number one spot. Dracula, my number one favorite Hammer film.